U.S. President Donald Trump has threatened to use a law normally reserved for economic emergencies to ban U.S. companies from operating in China. Are there sufficient grounds for using this extreme measure? And how detrimental would it be for those companies who are operating here successfully? Welcome to The Point, an opinion show coming to you live from Beijing. I'm Li Xin. There is no truce in sight for the trade war between China and the U.S., yet many large U.S. companies remain confident working in the Chinese market. Following in the steps of Tesla, GE and other U.S. corporations, American retailer Costco opened its first outlet in China on Tuesday. Just days earlier, U.S. President Donald Trump said he would evoke emergency powers and force U.S. companies to relocate operations from China before backtracking on this claim. Businesses have expressed concerns over Trump's remarks, with one saying Trump may be frustrated with China, but the answer isn't for U.S. companies to ignore a market with 1.4 billion consumers. So what is the judgment of American companies and how are they reacting to the contradicting messages sent by the U.S. administration. Joining me for the discussion from D.C. is Matt Priest, President and CEO of Footwear Distributor and Retailers of America, and from New York, Jack Pakulski, Managing Partner of JFP Holdings, an American company based here in Beijing. Gentlemen, welcome to The Point. Now, uh, Matt, the latest round of U.S. tariffs against China is directed squarely at consumer items like clothes, toys, uh, footwear and many consumer electronics. The U.S. footwear industry is viewed by analysts as one of the biggest victims. According to your association, 70% of shoes sold in America come from China. And in a previous interview, you said the consumer won't be able to hide. Even if it is 10%, it's death by a thousand cuts. So what's the future now for your industry and how much more tariffs will be added on footwear and uh, when? Yeah, it's a great question. I think the future for us as it looks right now over the horizon is that we, we're going to have consumer inflation. The administration here in the U.S. is intent on raising tariffs, taxes on American consumers uh, to send a message to our Chinese counterparts. And at the end of the day, the consumer is going to have to pay. And so when we look at footwear, apparel, uh, tech goods, consum other consumer products, they're all going to have increased duty rates. And as, I, as we've said before, we paid $1.5 billion in duties on footwear from China last year already. And so we know all too well what duties do to the cost of goods. And so we've been warning the, the administration that if you raise taxes on goods as they crum come across the border, that will impact consumers' ability to buy those products because prices will go up. And so that's our big concern is that the administration is, is taking an above all approach in impacting every single consumer good that's out there. Mm. Can you give us some numbers to illustrate what you said just now? For instance, you said you paid 1.5 billion U.S. dollars of tariffs last year. Um, how, how much of that uh, has, how much more expensive, let's say, the Americans uh, already had to pay uh, for a pair of uh, sneakers, let's say? Yeah, it's a great question. So we paid last year on, on all tariffs on all footwear on two and a half billion pairs of shoes, about three billion dollars in duties. And so that's about seven billion dollars in added cost for American consumers. And that's product coming from all of our sourcing countries, not just China. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to look to add an additional 15 percent on products starting this Sunday, uh, that's going to have a dramatic impact. And so we are estimating an additional $4 billion in, in added costs for consumers at the retail level uh, as it relates to footwear imports just because of this action that's going into effect on Sunday and subsequently December 15th. And so, again, we're the poster child. We, next year is the 90th anniversary of the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act of 1930, which started this movement towards taxing shoes and other items coming across our border and has done nothing to keep production here in the U.S. We've matured away from it. We've advanced out of it. And now we, we have 350,000 footwear jobs here in the U.S. that rely on our ability to import product from places like China. And all of that is under threat when you 
add these additional costs coming across the border. But have you done a calculation as to how much more an American uh, household would have to spend it when these uh, additional tariffs come into place? Yeah, there have been a, a number of calculations that look to upwards of $1,000 in additional costs on an American household as, as the U.S. government looks to uh, apply these duties. Uh, if you look at a pair of $50 shoes here in the U.S., canvas sneakers that a kid, a, a parent might buy for their children, you could have an additional $10 just on that pair of shoes just to cover the cost of the duties as they come across the border. Mm -hmm. And then you apply that to every single consumer good out there, you can see it, co it compounds very quickly across a variety of different sectors. All right. Um, Jack, let me ask you uh, your reaction to what uh, U.S. Senator Lindsey Graham, he was talking about uh, that Americans will have to live with the pain of the tariff uh, escalation. Uh, when asked uh, on Fox News whether President Trump is deceiving the American people about the, the truth of the tariffs, he did not answer the question, only saying that he's worried that Americans don't stand behind their president. Do you think that um, um, American politicians are really telling the truth about the true effects of the trade war that they are waging? Well, you know, when you talk about international trade between two large countries like China and the United States, it's, uh, it's very complicated, or the, the economic and the trade issues are very, very complicated, and, and therefore the impact of uh, anything that's done with respect to tariffs has a, you know, a very complicated and a very you know, diverse set of results. So, uh, you know, depending, you know, and so politicians tend to try to simplify things, you know, get everything down to a simple soundbite. And, uh, and I think to that extent, yes, they are, you know, misleading uh, the American people about the, you know, about the impact. And, and in, in these times when you have such complicated issues, to really try to simplify things too much you know, really does the whole topic hmm. a huge disservice. Yeah, he also talked about a trade deficit, and this is something we've heard again and again, the trade deficit being the loss uh, on the part of the United States. Um, Jack, is there any way you can help explain, or what is your understanding of what, whether trade deficit is hurting the United States or um, is, is a loss on the part of the U.S. Uh, businesses or U.S. consumers because uh, from the Chinese perspective, we simply don't understand that. These are trade transactions that are sealed because both sides consented to, to these terms. Um, we don't understand why trade deficit is lost to the Americans. Hey, and this is a, a topic that economists write uh, you know, have written thousands of papers on whether it's a, a plus or a minus. I, th I think the general answer is that to the extent that a country like the United States uh, imports products, that basically to the extent that those products are being made cheaper somewhere else, that's a net benefit to the uh, to the consumer. And, and you know, and so uh, you know, the United States is a very mature, very sophisticated economy, and as Matt said before, you've kind of gotten out of the production of certain products. Certainly it doesn't make sense from an economic point of view to be continue to produce a product that, uh, you know, that perhaps right. your economy is not necessarily the most effective at producing. Yeah. Uh, Matt, what is your take? Because your members, the, the retailers, the, the distributors, they pay money to buy shoes from China and they distribute to uh, uh, customers in the United States. Do you consider that money lost or something else? No, of course not. And, and that's one, been one of our biggest frustrations with the administration. Uh, is the fact that they focus so intently on the trade deficit. And as, as economists will say in a general sense, is that trade deficits are neither good nor bad, they just kind of are. And for us as a consuming nation, we, got, we receive goods in response to the money that has been paid out to go to these providers all over the world. And the irony is that as our economy has done really well, we, we're in a really long economic period, you know, over a decade now we've been growing, uh, our trade deficit has gone up and that's because we have the, the highest spending power in the world and our consumers can purchase goods. And so we actually, from our perspective, see that as a positive and, and there's a lot of debate around that. But you have to remember where we started this from. We started this investigation in August of 2017 around intellectual property protection. 
And, and we have our concerns about intellectual property protection in places like China and Russia and elsewhere. But at the end of the day, are you going to tax American consumers on goods just to, to try to get at the intellectual property challenge that we have with our varying trading partner, various trading partners? And our answer to that is no, you shouldn't do that. But since then, the narrative has changed to it's a, it's a trade deficit issue. And so those are two different things in our minds, and we think they should be, the remedies to those should be mm. quite different. Uh, however, however you tried, and uh, many people who went to these hearings before new rounds of uh, tariffs are announced, uh, voice opposition to the escalation of tariffs, and yet it seems that uh, uh, nothing has worked so far. For instance, uh, you wrote letters, right, to uh, President Trump uh, trying to persuade him not to raise uh, any more tariffs on shoes, and it seems it didn't work. Why? That's a great question. There were 321 people that testified over a seven-day period in late June, and 13 or 14 of those people were footwear executives. And I could count, I think, on one hand the amount of people that were supportive of the action. Uh, and so, you know, we, the, President Trump is an unconventional president, and a lot of American people like his approach. Others are more concerned. When you look at it in a nonpartisan way, businesses like predictability. They like certainty. And so when an administration, no matter which political party is in power, can't provide that certainty, it's going to create friction. It's going to create problems. And so we are in an era right now where we could be growing even more exponentially than we are, but we just don't have the certainty that we need to invest because we might any day now have an additional, on top of 15%, may have a 25% tariff, which would jack up our tariffs by billions of dollars more. And that's just not an environment for success. And so that's, that's our biggest concern as it relates mm -hmm. to the tactics of the president. And our yeah. hope is that of all the letters submitted and all the people testifying that he will hear our message ultimately. Um, Jack, what is your take of the story uh, which just happened a couple of, uh, actually on Tuesday when uh, Costco opened its first shop in Shanghai and the, the shop had to close earlier, bec early because of crowds. There were just so many people lining up to, to snatch up everything from luxury bags to pork. Um, what does that mean to you and uh, do you think the American consumers and the American general public understand the huge potential um, consuming power in the Chinese market that is yet to be unleashed and there is a great potential for American businesses. Unfortunately, the, the, the tariff war is not helping American businesses to tap into that uh, reservoir of uh, consuming power. Yeah, in all these trade uh, discussions and, and talks and so forth, the emphasis, you know, has been on the exporting and the importing of, uh, of products to and from China. In reality, the real story is the China consumption story. I mean, China is now one of the, is the largest consumer in the world for just about every type of product. So it behooves American companies to, uh, to, to you know, one way or another, to participate in the growth of the very large and growing China market. So I think... Uh, you know, Tesco's or, or uh, Costco. uh, Costco's opening of their store in Shanghai essentially underscores their commitment and their belief that the China consumption story is here to stay and it makes sense for them as a major American company to participate All in right. that. Okay, thank you so much. We're going to. Yeah, that's the really the main reason for yes, companies go ahead. to do it. Yeah, go ahead, please. No, as, uh, as I was going to say, you know, to participate in the China economy is the main reason why companies from the U.S. are investing in the country. All right. Thank you so much. Matt Priest from uh, Footwear Distributors and Retailers of America and Jack Pakulski of JFP Holdings Limited. You are watching The Point. We'll take a short break, and when we come back, we'll have more on the uncertainties facing U.S. businesses here in China. Stay with us. Welcome back. Joining me in the studio to continue our discussion on the future of China, trade and Trump, uh, Timothy Stratford, chairman of the American Chamber of Commerce and also managing partner of uh, Covington and Berlin LLP based in Beijing and Zhao Hai, research fellow at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Gentlemen, welcome to The Point. Let's continue with the Costco 
um, story, actually, the footages that, that our audience has just saw uh, were the civilized ones, right? <laughs> we saw online where people really literally just, you know, um, pile over each other to grab uh, whatever they could find, and they were snatching up luxury bags, they were snatching up uh, bottles of Chinese liquor, which cost over $100 per bottle and stuff like that. So, um, um, Tim, what does that say about the, the, the potential of the Chinese uh, consumer market for you, or are you reading something else there in that story? No, well, I think, um, I think everybody knows that the potential of the Chinese consumer market is huge, mm. and China continues to be more prosperous. There are more and more people who uh, they aspire to be able to get some of the, the, you know, the things that people enjoy around the world, and so uh, whether you're talking about the consumer market or you're talking about manufa manufacturing goods or other things, uh, China is, is probably the most significant growing market in the world. Mm. And still, uh, Zhao Hai, there is something spectacular about mm. the, the scene that we saw in mm. Co Costco. What do you think uh, um, is behind mm. such, um, almost there's a surprise, right? Maybe mm. that uh, um, the people are so interested in, in what Costco can offer or that the Chinese people, consumers, are still very much in interested in buying from American uh, supermarkets? Or what is it that we're seeing that's surprising us? Uh, I think Costco is a different model uh, than what has been uh, running in, in China. So it differentiates itself from other uh, types of uh, uh, supermarket stores. And, it, and that's one thing I think uh, we understand uh, coming out of this story is how uh, the Chinese middle class is growing and the market is still growing. But I, I want to emphasize another point, which is pres both President Xi and recently Vice Premier Liu He and all the uh, other Chinese leadership uh, said, uh, uh, stress this point that China welcomes uh, uh, investment from the United States and from around the globe. So I think that's a sign that Costco uh, could open more stores in China and also many other American companies wants to take advantage of the Chinese uh, market, growing market, mm -hmm. should continue to come. But it seems that from the U.S. side, at least from uh, U.S. President Donald Trump, it seems that any U.S. companies who are operating in China who want to come to China are uh, doing this against very strong headwinds, right? Most recently, he was talking about ordering Chinese companies to come back to leave China, and uh, although he didn't really follow up on that claim. Tim, exactly um, what are you hearing and what is your understanding of the messages that come out of President Trump? Well, you know, uh, as we've all noted, President Trump uh, seems to give contradictory messages uh, in short succession, one mm -hmm. after the other. And I, I think we need to understand, you know, why has he given this message? Why has he given that message? And he seems to be reacting to things. On the one hand, he doesn't want to take actions that would severely uh, hurt our stock market or our confidence in the United States, our overall economy. On the other hand, he wants to, you know, uh, put a strong face to, to, the, to China to say, you know, I'm going to be a very determined negotiator, don't think it's going to be easy. So I think he wants to do both things at the same time. So what I do is I try to say, what is he responding to and what do I think is going to be happening to the underlying fundamentals that he's responding to? Mm. And that will give me a, more of a sense of where things are likely headed. And do you have a sense of where things are likely headed after hearing uh, a, a, a you know, array of uh, messages coming over last week, for instance, this uh, ordering U.S. companies to come out of China, and then he was talking about um, China calling him. Obviously, China said nobody called him or his team, and, uh, you know, all of the, and that he had regrets possibly about uh, the trade, the tariffs, but then he said he had regrets about everything. And then his team also went on show uh, to clarify that he actually regretted not imposing even higher tariffs on China. I mean, uh, Tim. So, so I think, you know, I think everybody needs to take a deep breath. I think we need to uh, step back and not overreact to every tweet, but recognize that those tweets have a political purpose at that moment for particular audiences and then step back and made a, make a, an assessment that's b based on a, a broader criteria. You know, what the business community wants mm -hmm. is for our very capable trade negotiators from both countries to be able to sit down, go, do a good deal that's fair to both countries, 
that addresses some of the longstanding issues that we've seen uh, and let them do that and create the right political space so that they can do their jobs. Mm -hmm. And right now it's hard for them to do that because the political environment seems to be shifting so much. Yeah. Zhao Hai, how has the Chinese government been reacting to all of these messages that I just mentioned? Actually, mm -hmm. just a few examples. Are they really listening and reacting to everything, or are they picking mm -hmm. what they think can be understood, can react to, or are they just sitting and uh, collect, you know, looking at all of these me messages from a holistic point of view? Uh, I think the Chinese government uh, responded saying that number one, we need to calm down and be reasonable uh, at every what does possible that mean, opportunity. Though? That means that means don't do it tit for tat. Don't escalate the trade war further. And it's very clear that so far, Chinese side are not responding to what Trump tweets or what he says, but what he does. So so far, what happened is that after G20 uh, in Osaka. Uh, President Trump and his administration is violating the agreement during that uh, meeting and then continue to escalate this trade war by adding more tariffs on Chinese export to the United States. So when you do that, you cannot expect China to sit still and not respond. And when China responded, uh, that's when uh, Trump thinking that uh, this is politically motivated, that would harm his possibility of re-election. And that's the wrong way to think about it. Uh, and I think the U.S. side, particularly President Trump, should calm down and uh, respond positively, uh, trying to, just like Tim said, let the negotiators resolve this problem. Does that look likely? I mean, there are uh, many reports which are pointing to the sense of desperation or frustration on the part of the U.S. administration that the trade talks have not progressed where they want it, or at least it seems, and that he has not been able to make China give in to the kind of pressure um, Tim, I, d I don't think that President Trump is desperate to have a deal. Um, I don't Why think not? I don't think that China is desperate to have a deal either. I think that you know the issues that at stake are very big and uh, and will have long-term implications. So I think each government is looking at the situation and you know in, in these negotiations you try to evaluate you know the strengths and the weaknesses of the other side. And right now I think neither side feels that it's ready to put its final offer on the table. You know, I think on the Chinese side, if, if it, it's hard to figure out what is the U.S. objective because if President Trump is cornering China's senior leadership publicly, mm -hmm. he certainly can't expect that China's leaders are going to back down publicly. No. So why is he doing this? It's hard for the Chinese side to understand that and therefore they'll want to stay engaged, but I think they want to wait and see is the U.S. economy going to take a downturn and so President uh, Trump may be more interested in closing a deal? Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, on the U.S. side, I think they want to see how China reacts and you know, how is the economy reacting here and what are the other pressures. Mm -hmm. So I think neither side is quite ready yet to make a deal because they're not quite sure that they understand where the other side is. So American companies caught in the middle. Um, what is your assessment of their sentiment, overall sentiment at this moment? I mean, it must not be a very exciting time for them. Um, you have surveys, I understand. What's the, the latest survey telling us? So if we, if we describe the business community's sentiment, I would use three words, uh, uncertain, frustrated, and exhausted. Uh, to, to be more specific, uh, we had a survey of our members in early May and one of the most striking results of the survey was that 40 percent said that they are either planning to move or are considering to move some of their manufacturing outside of China. Uh, and that's really quite an astonishing high number. Mm. The problem is in, when you have uncertainty, you, you can't plan business based on uncertainty and so you have to have an alternative scenario and so people are having to make those decisions. There's some people in the U.S. government and this is not a uniform view of the U.S. government at all but there's some people mm. that would like to see more American companies withdraw out of China yeah. because they think that this decoupling uh, ultimately is in the U.S. best interest. Most of us don't think that that's the right answer mm. but if you have that view then creating the uncertainty uh, uh, forces that process of decoupling yeah. to continue. What about the rest of the 60 percent? How much confidence are they or um, they have enough reassurance from what, they're, what they have in front of them to say we're going to stay here for the moment? Well I think a lot of it depends on what 
what your business model is for China. For example, one very important business model for companies is manufacture in China for the Chinese market. Okay. This is a huge market. And if you're doing that, then the tariffs don't affect you quite so directly. Mm. Mm. Hai. I would disagree with uh, Tim for uh, the deal. I think uh, Trump wants a quick deal. He wants a grand, beautiful deal right away. But the thing is, he wants the deal under his terms. Not he doesn't want to listen from the Chinese side, and and he wants a win victory deal for himself, not a balanced deal. That's why so far we haven't had any deal. And he said the trade war is easy to win. Um, and for the Chinese side, we want to deal too because we know that companies on both sides and people on both sides are suffering. Yeah. Uh, so the reason, uh, of course, if you look at the content contained in that, it's such a br very broad uh, deal covering everything, it takes time to negotiate. So I think there's a fundamental conflict between okay. the timelines. All right, Tim. Um, oh, I don't, I don't disagree that, pres I mean, what I said is I don't think he's desperate to have a deal mm -hmm. um, under, you know, at all costs. Uh, I think he would very much like to have a deal. I, I don't think that Trump himself, President Trump himself, mm -hmm. is squarely in the decoupling camp. I think if he can see a good deal, I think he'd like to see that. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that he necessarily feels that that has to happen immediately. Yeah. How much longer can China keep uh, without blinking? I mean, how much is the Chinese economy resilient for a prolonged trade war? Very briefly, please. I think that's not the question. China needs a fair and balanced deal, and that's the ultimate goal. So even if the tariffs are hurting, China is going to stand its Chi ground? China, yes, and China will not make the concession not at all. Uh, uh, to sacrifice China's own national interest. Well, um, does President Trump know that message? I think he does, but I don't think the question is black and white. I think we have a whole list of issues that are being discussed and some of them China can agree to and some of them can't and maybe they can agree differently if the US also agrees with this so it's not just a black and white question mm. these are things that negotiations can negotiators yeah. can resolve but if he goes on uh, cornering China in public that's going to make it very difficult for China to uh, agree to sit down and, and, and talk I guess no doubt yeah and Zhao Hai yeah, I think uh, ultimately... To look okay in public, to, to be acceptable, right? In, to yeah. look acceptable in public. I think with, when this prolongs, ultimately both sides need to come back to the, to the negotiation table okay. and make concessions. All right. Thank you so much, my two guests, uh, Timothy Strafford, Chairman of the American Chamber of Commerce, and Zhao Hai from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of The Point with me, Li Xin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle The Point with LX. Download the application called CGTN to watch the show on your mobile devices or go to YouTube and look for CGTN The Point. Thanks for watching. We've got The Point. <laughs>